In this video, we focus on quanti quantitative aspects of phase diagrams. Okay, just to remind you of what a phase diagram is, uh, it's just a map in which we plot pressure versus temperature. And uh, that map contains regions uh, that determine what of the three phases or more phases in a substance uh, uh, is the stable one at a particular set of pressure and temperature. Right, so uh, most phase diagrams look like this. Okay, and we've seen uh, deviations from this trend for water, and uh, we've also seen that this solid phase can get more complicated if you have more than uh, more than one solid phase. Right, so uh, until now, we've described these phase diagrams using a qualitative approach in which we were just describing how these phase boundaries are measured, um, uh, what the triple point, what the uh, triple point is, what the critical point is, and so forth. What we're going to do next is actually uh, take a more quantitative approach to see that we can actually uh, predict uh, aspects of these phase boundaries uh, doing a little bit of thermodynamic work that we're familiar with from uh, earlier uh, in this chapter. Okay, so uh, let's get to any of these points in a phase boundary. And I'm using the liquid gas phase boundary, but it could be uh, any of the three phase boundaries. And uh, something important there is that you have an equilibrium. Okay, so uh, what happens here is that the Mohr Gibbs energy of one of the phases is identical to the Mohr Gibbs energy of the other phases. No phase uh, is more stable than the other one, both of them are equally stable, and that means that the Mohr Gibbs energy is identical. Again, uh, in the diagram I'm going to be referring to the liquid gas phase boundary, but this could be done for any of the phase boundaries. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be, uh, be doing this as uh, generic alpha and beta phases where alpha can be the liquid, beta can be the gas, or any combination of phases that you want. Okay, so the question that we ask is as follows. Suppose that uh, you disrupt the equilibrium by uh, maybe increasing the pressure or increasing the temperature, uh, how much would you like to change the other variable to remain at equilibrium? That's essentially what we're, what we're going to be uh, trying to ask here. Okay, so again, suppose that you change one variable by this, the question is how much do you have to change the other to remain in the curve. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, essentially what you're doing is changing a little bit uh, the Mohr Gibbs energy of both phases when you change one of the uh, properties, right? The, the pressure or the temperature. So, essentially, what you're doing is uh, trying to calculate uh, this. Okay, a change in pressure or in temperature is going to mean uh, a change in the Mohr Gibbs energy. But to remain at equilibrium, that means that the Mohr Gibbs energy of the other phase has to be exactly the same as the change in the Mohr Gibbs energy of the phase uh, of one of the phases. All right. So the question is, well, uh, uh, how can we uh, make sense uh, of this? We actually have studied very well uh, that the Mohr Gibbs energy only depends on pressure and temperature, and we actually know the explicit dependence of the Mohr Gibbs energy on the pressure and the temperature. That explicit dependence is uh, like this: for phase alpha. Uh, it turns out this is going to be the molar volume of the alpha phase multiplied by differential of P minus the molar entropy of the alpha phase multiplied by differential of T. And then for the beta phase would be exactly the same uh, but with beta subscripts. Okay, so molar volume of the beta phase, differential of P minus molar entropy of the beta phase, differential of T. Okay. I'm going to erase this phase diagram and then continue up on top. All right, so we can consolidate terms. Uh, we're going to be using here the um, more entropies first. Okay, so if we consolidate the more entropies, you get the more entropy of the beta phase, differential of T, minus the more entropy of the alpha phase, differential of T, has to be equal to uh, the more volume of the beta phase, differential of P minus the molar volume of the alpha phase differential uh, of P. Okay, so now we have uh, terms that are alike that depend on the same uh, differential on, on the different sides of the equation. All right, so let's take a more factor of that uh, differential. This is going to be differential of T, uh, common factor of more entropy of beta minus the more entropy of alpha. And then differential of P, common factor of the molar uh, volume of the beta phase minus the molar volume of the alpha phase. Okay? All right, now we're ready to take that ratio of differentials, and this is going to be differential of P 
over differential of t is going to be equal to um, the change in the molar entropy from alpha to beta over the change in the molar volume from alpha to beta. OK, notice that this change in the molar entropy when you go from alpha to beta would be the molar entropy of the final phase, beta, minus the molar entropy of the initial phase, alpha. And that is exactly what we have right here. And that's exactly the same uh, thing here. But the change in uh, the molar volume when you go from alpha to beta will be the molar volume of the final phase minus the uh, molar volume of the initial phase. Okay, so that's essentially what we have right here. All right, now, uh, what about this term? So, so this is just a change in entropy uh, upon the phase transition, which we know how to calculate. And that will be how the molar volume uh, changes when you uh, have the phase transition. Well, uh, this is something that we actually know how to calculate. This is a phase transition. And we know that uh, for a phase transition, the change in entropy okay, can be calculated simply as the change uh, in the enthalpy of the phase transition over the temperature at which that phase transition is taking place. Okay, this is uh, uh, something that we used uh, when we were calculating changes in entropy for the system in phase transitions. Okay, so we can go and apply that here. And this is going to be equal to uh, the change in uh, molar entropy when you go from the alpha to the beta phase over the temperature of that uh, phase transition multiplied by the change in molar volume from alpha to beta. Okay. All right, so that's uh, what we actually call the Clapeyron equation, which I'm sure you've seen in, in other courses like general chemistry. The question is, uh, what information does this equation provide? Okay, notice what you have here is the first derivative of the pressure with respect to the temperature. And uh, a phase diagram uh, actually is pressure versus temperature. Okay, we know quite well that when you're uh, representing a function as a, uh, as a function of the variable, okay, the slope of that representation is equal to uh, the first uh, derivative of the function with respect to the variable. Okay, so essentially what we're calculating with this Clapeyron equation is this. Okay, uh, that would be the phase diagram gas, liquid, and solid, we are uh, asking about a point right here. And what the Clapeyron equation allows you to calculate is the slope of a tangent line to that curve. Write that. Okay? Notice that you can trace this at any point that you want, right? We've chosen this point, but we could uh, choose now this one and trace the line right there and then that one like this. So notice how with the Clapeyron equation you can actually trace the entire phase boundary as you go along, as you change uh, uh, the conditions of pressure and temperature which this takes place. Okay, so this is a very useful uh, uh, equation and we will see a few applications of, uh, uh, of the prediction of the slope uh, for various phase boundaries uh, in the problems. Now notice that the calculation is actually not difficult. This is just a change in enthalpy in the phase transition and this is given, uh, given in tables. Uh, and then this is uh, the temperature at which the phase transition uh, takes place and that's also uh, available. Uh, and then uh, you need to know the molar volumes of the phases. So the statement of the problem is usually are going to give you the molar volumes of the phases for that particular set of conditions of temperature or pressure, or it might also give you the information about the molar volume uh, in a slightly different way that uses the density. Okay, notice that what we're trying to calculate here is the molar volume, okay, and it turns out that the molar volume can be calculated from the molar mass and the density of a particular phase. Okay, so how does this work? Notice that the molar mass is kilograms per mole, and the density is kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so uh, these kilograms go away, and then you get cubic meters per mole, which is exactly what the molar volume is, the volume occupied by one mole of the systems. Okay, so again, uh, uh, the problems will ask you to calculate this, uh, these slopes for a uh, uh, phase transition, and again, it will uh, provide you the, the molar volume of the phases directly, or maybe it will provide you the density of the phases, and with a molar mass, you will be able to compute that. Okay, so this is uh, the Clapeyron equation.